So let us move on in our study to Psalm, to, uh, Psalm 22, but actually it's John chapter 9. We're looking at the fulfillment of prophecy as explicitly called out by the apostles. And of course, when they tell us things, you know, we know that that's where it comes from, but we know too that they're inspired, they're right about this, but we know that there's more to it than, than just one verse. They're not you know, cherry-picking um, precise details that are explicitly about the first century and, and, and uh, the Son of God necessarily. So you, you're not necessarily looking for just this one verse by itself. When they quote from something, you've got to look at the big picture there and understand what's What's being said in that passage? What are the themes here? And very often you'll find that that same passage is used many times over, or that many of the themes of that passage actually apply and carry into the New Testament. And so it's quite helpful, I think, to start with the ones that they point out. But as Jesus taught in his parable of the talents, we are supposed to give God a return for what he has vested in us. We should be able to take what the apostles point us to and literally call out and understand the rest of that and look at those passages to see where they apply to the New Testament even when they're not explicitly called out. That would be giving God a return on his investment because he reaps where he did not sow. But John 19 is the place that uh, we've been starting from um, with the crucifixion. And there are two things here. One is about his clothing being divided up. Another is about his thirst, his physical condition. Both of these are called out as the fulfillment of what was written, the fulfillment of Scripture. And so I wanted to look at them. They both come from Psalm 22, as you have probably already seen if you've looked at the slides. John 19, it is uh, verses 23 and 24 where the record speaks about these details of the crucifixion. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic, which is the undergarment. So his outer garments, they, you know, divided by four and divided them amongst themselves. The inner garment, however, the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom, which is one of those things that is spoken of in the law of Moses someplace. So they said to one another, let's not tear it, but rather cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This particular garment they did not want to take into pieces because there were not seams that they could then form into a new garment. This one was whole, so they did not tear it up, but that means they had to decide whose it was going to be. And so they cast lots or roll dice, you know, or we might say rock, paper, scissors or whatever. It's a thing of chance. And this fulfills the scripture which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Says John. The thing that happened there, the reason why it came about the way that it did, it fulfilled what was written before, and that is written in Psalm 22. Literally, Psalm 22, verse 18, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. This is a direct quotation. We'll get back to Psalm 22, but continue with me in John 19 here for a bit. At the 28th verse, he said, After this, Jesus, knowing that all now was finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. And when he, Jesus, had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. 
This too, John says, is in order to fulfill what was written. This also is something, this I thirst, happens also in Psalm 22. For example, at verse 15, my strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. This is certainly about thirst, dryness. The potsherd is a shard of pottery. So that's, that's pretty dry. And we'll get to this forthwith. So at this point, we should go back and read Psalm 22 together. We've already been told by John explicitly that there are at least two things in the crucifixion that refer back to Psalm 22. But there are actually quite a few things once you go back and read the text that you probably will recognize if you have familiarity with the Gospels already, for example. And I don't say that we read the entire psalm, but if we look at this together, I would like to demonstrate to you that the other verses of the psalm also have echoes in the New Testament. And there are probably others that are not included in this lesson, but, you know, I tried to pick the ones that are fairly clear. The first thing is the psalm begins this way. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? That's the beginning of Psalm 22. That's how it starts. And in fact, the Gospel of Matthew records, Matthew 27 and verse 46, that when Jesus was being crucified, he from the cross cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's very clear that Jesus himself quotes from Psalm 22. When John tells us that these other things that happened fulfill Psalm 22, he has it on good authority, not just because he's inspired by the Holy Spirit, but he, though he is, but because Jesus himself did this from the cross. He's the one who said, this is Psalm 22. By yelling it out and quoting this directly, he's the speaker in Psalm 22. And the events of Psalm 22 are what are in unfolding before your eyes if you are there seeing him be crucified. I suspect, and I will say suspect, I'm not going to bind this, but I suspect that this has a lot to do with the thief on the cross having a change of heart. One of the Gospels records that he mocked Jesus and reviled Jesus. And the other of them, of course, records that he repented and he asked the Lord to remember him when he comes into his kingdom. You got to think that between those things, you know, he started out one way, but then when Jesus quotes Psalm 22, and you start thinking about Psalm 22, because perhaps he knew this, and you start looking around at what's happening, you realize this is all about him. This is, a, this is prophetic. And if you come to understand it, then you know what's coming, the second half of the psalm. But yes, Jesus is the one who invoked this. He's the reason why uh, it starts, and it's, it's firmly pinned this way. That's what this is about. I understand that David penned it, and he also, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, could well have spoken about somebody that was not him. Of course, he clearly did in the case of, you'll not, under, you'll not allow your Holy One to undergo decay, because he did undergo decay. He clearly was talking about somebody else. And this well may have been about Jesus and never about himself, but it's also acceptable to read it as metaphorical for the suffering he underwent. Nonetheless, it's clear when Jesus quotes it that it is literally about him, and John tells us it's literally about him. 
The second verse of Psalm 22. My God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. And this is what we know, is that the Lord was in the garden of Gethsemane at night. And he cried out to God mightily. And his prayer, in summary, in Matthew 26 at verse 39, is, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. His request was not to undergo crucifixion. And the Gospels tell us how strenuously he did this, how his sweat was dropping, how he was extremely anxious, asking if this cup could pass, if he could somehow not have to undergo crucifixion. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And you know what the answer to this prayer was? The answer was no. You do have to undergo crucifixion. It must be so. So when he says, I cry by day, you don't answer by night and find no rest. Yeah, this refers to what's happening here. The Gospels record his discussions with the apostles ahead of time, saying, and what shall I say? Father, deliver me from this hour. He cries out by day, he cries out by night, but he still has to do it. He still has to go to the cross. It's the only way. But you know, the other side of that is very important in Hebrews chapter 5. It's verse 7, even just the first half of Hebrews 5, verse 7. But it tells us there that in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. So he was crying out to God. This was offered in the days of his flesh. It seems fairly clear that when we speak of prayer, supplication, loud cries and tears, we are talking about Gethsemane. And there are many instances of this. You may recall details. Say, for example, in the story of Joseph, when his brothers betrayed him. When his brothers came back and met him in Egypt and didn't know who he was and were talking to themselves, remember, one of them said, we heard his cries for mercy, but we did not listen. Remember that detail? Some of you do. Psalm 22 continues. We have 6, 7, and 8 of Psalm 22. I am a worm, not a man, scorned by mankind, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord deliver him. Let the Lord rescue him, for he delights in him. This is the mockery that they offered. He's a worm, not a man, scorned, despised by the people. They mock, they make faces, you know, all the terrible things that are happening in a crucifixion. And this also was recorded in Matthew 27, verse 43. He trusts in God, they said. Let God deliver him now if he desires him, for he said, I am the Son of God. This is... Verbatim quote, Psalm 22, which they fulfilled without realizing it, of course, but this is what they said. Now, a crucifixion, you've got to understand, the point of crucifixion is shame. Well, pain, but shame. They, you know, the reason that they want it to be slow is not just the pain, but they want you to be alive and in pain while people come and mock you. That's the, that's the punishment. Is everybody gets to come and say how much they hate you and how angry they are at you for what you have done. That's what it's about. So this is what's happening. And you see this terrible thing, like, well, well if, if 
you know, if God is so powerful and if God loves him, then why is he suffering? Well, that's the thing the devil always says. <laughs> In fact, if you look at Psalm 22 pretty closely, you see that, yeah, there's a lot of details here that accord with the crucifixion scene. Again, verse 6 said, I'm a worm, not a man, scorned by mankind, despised by the people. That's exactly what crucifixion is for. It's a public spectacle. They nail you to a piece of wood, not fatally. You know, people there died from losing the strength to breathe, to hold themselves up and breathe, or from thirst in the, several days is what it would take, typically. They, they did this so that the whole town would have a chance to come out and do terrible things to you and say terrible things to you. Yes, he said, all who see me mock me. That's what it's for. They stare and they gloat over me, is recorded in Psalm 22, verse 17. After saying, I can count all my bones, he said, they stare and gloat over me. So there's, on the one hand, the, the nakedness uh, in which they are affixed to the crucifix, but there's also this, people are gloating. They are glad that you are suffering. That's what it's for. And Psalm 22 is full of these details that accord with crucifixion. Again, at the 17th verse, that first half said, I can count all my bones, which may refer to him being thin, wasting away, but no, I mean, it could, but that's not what it means. If you look at the 16th verse, having said, they pierced my hands and feet, I can count my bones, they stare and gloat. It's talking about the fact that when they nail you to the wood like this, it's not natural. The angle is not natural, and the weight of the body is not natural. And everything is out of place and out of joint. So he feels it. Every bone is, is, feels the pressure of this thing. And again, at the 14th, he had said, I'm poured out like water, as we mentioned earlier, the thirst. He said, I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax melted within my breast. A waxy heart as they dry out, as the blood gets thicker. And this was thought to be one of the primary ways that people died, if they were beaten very badly and they bled a lot, then the blood would become so thick that the heart couldn't pump it anymore. And that's what they think happened in the case of Jesus since he died very quickly for a crucifixion victim. But you see this idea that the bones are out of joint, the heart is working really hard to move that very thick blood, he's melting on the inside. These are very well in accord with the crucifixion. The, the other thing, as we said, is the, the spectacle of it. He's surrounded. Many bulls encompass me, Psalm 22, 12 said. Strong bulls surround me. Yeah, the people all around are strong. The soldiers who have thrown him to the ground and nailed him to the wood, they're strong. They cannot be overcome. You're surrounded by people who only mean you harm. And again, at the 16th, dogs encompass me. That's as good a word as any for the Romans. A company of evildoers encircles me, and that's as good a word as any for the ruling class of Judea. Jew and Gentile alike, we are both guilty of this. But the circle for the mockery all these things and more are very clear in their description of the scene of a crucifixion. So when John refers to it, yeah, it's clear that he wants us to look at it and to see how many things there refer to something else in, in the New Testament. And it's clear when, when Jesus calls it out from the cross, 
that he sets in motion this very clear interpretation. Well, there are others. There's a point in the psalm where things change. In Psalm 22, it's at verse 21, after he calls to be delivered and saved. There's a point at verse 21 where he says, You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. And suddenly, in the 22nd verse of Psalm 22, we're now talking about the future. This is the point at which Jesus has died. And he says, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Well, let's look first here at the congregation. You know, you're accustomed to, if you're accustomed to reading the Old Testament, you're accustomed to the congregation of the children of Israel, the congregation of the people, you know, this word being used. Well, this word, congregation, uh, is ecclesia. That is used in the New Testament all the time as well. But when it's used in the New Testament, they usually translate it church. <laughs> it's the congregation. The church is the congregation. Uh, that's why we call this a local congregation, maybe. Maybe. Or maybe we just got lucky. But in the midst of the church, I will praise you is what it says. We are the congregation of the people today. We are the Israel of God today, Galatians 6 tells us. So that's an interesting thing that he said. Also, if you understand, you know, the congregation is the gathering of the people. How will he rejoin the gathering of the people unless he becomes a people again. <laughs> well, that's what happens, of course. He is resurrected again. He is resurrected. But then, of course, there's the primary uh, uh, statement there, which is, I'll tell of your name to my brothers. So Jesus will extol the goodness of God, of the name of the Lord. To whom? To my brothers. Which is something very important as Hebrew tell, Hebrews tells it, and I do want to look at that one in a little bit more detail. Hebrews 2 is the, the verse, or the, the chapter, Hebrews chapter 2, but it begins at verse 9, where he says, yeah, we see this one named Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, meaning he became flesh, <laughs> crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, that is, that God, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. It was fitting that God should make perfect this Jesus, the founder of our salvation, that he, that God should make him perfect through, by way of suffering. What makes it complete? What makes it full? How is he like us in all aspects? He also suffers as you and I suffer. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one and the same source. That is, this Jesus has God as his Father. And through Jesus, we come to call God our Father. Which is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers or brethren, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. He's our brother. We're the people he's talking about when he says, I will tell of your name to my brothers. Jesus is the one who points to God the Father and points us to God the Father, and we're considered his brothers. 
It says he's not ashamed to call them brothers because he has taken on flesh as we have flesh. He's undergone suffering as we suffer. And it says he tasted death for everyone that we might be saved, that we might be delivered from fear of death. And yes, that comes from Psalm 22. One who underwent the most horrible of all possible deaths is the one who can come back from that and extol the name of God in the church. And he's the one that calls us brothers and sisters. We are therefore children of God. Right? That's what's happening. As 1 John 3 says, Behold, right? what a blessing it is to be called the children of God. And yes, it's also noted in Psalm 22, and we're going to close here. But this also, I think, should be emphasized in the same way that we speak of brethren in the church after this resurrection. So also we speak about this fact in Psalm 22, It says at verse 24, well, after having said, you who fear the Lord, verse 23, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted one. And he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard him when he cried to him. Well, in the psalm, this refers directly to the first and second verses. Why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? I cry by day, but you don't answer. It says he's not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted one, verse 24. The fact is, even though Jesus had to suffer, as, as Hebrews 2 said, it was fitting that he should be perfected through suffering. The fact is, God did not despise it. He did not abhor it. He has not hidden his face from him. As some people blasphemously have said, it's blasphemous. The idea that God turned his face away from Jesus when he was crucified, that's blasphemy. The Bible very clearly says that's not true. He saw that. He looked on that. He knew what was happening. It pained him to his very spirit. He did not hide his face from him. God did not hide his face from his son, Jesus. He heard when he cried to him. It's just that this is the way it had to be. This is the only means of salvation for all of humanity. No, he's been heard. And the, the, the sum of, of all of that, that the Lord now knows, if you will, in retrospect from this, in the psalm, now that he is in paradise, now that there is a resurrection, now that he is glorified, now he can see that big picture, if you will. Not that he didn't know before. Don't misunderstand me. But in the, in the context of the psalm and the progression from being a victim to being a victor, he now can look back and realize, yeah, the answer was no. It had to be that way. And you know what? It's better. It's better. Because now he has a name that is above every name. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the founder of our salvation. On the whole, God's way was better, even if it seemed arduous for the moment. Discipline never seems pleasant, but afterward it does yield righteousness. And if need be, we suffer here for a little time, though we are looking forward to an inheritance laid up for us in heaven. 
Now, Hebrews 5 and verse 7, the rest of the verse comments on this from the Psalms that God did not hide from him. It says, In the days of his flesh, Hebrews 5, 7, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his godly fear. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. That's the promise for us today. Yes, God looked upon him. Yes, God knew what was happening. This is not lost on him. He saw that suffering. He knew about it. He knew what was going to happen. Jesus knew what was going to happen before he even came to earth. But he did it anyway because he loves us. And because, as Hebrews 12 said, he looked forward for the joy set before him that we could be saved, that we could join him in the great congregation, the Israel of God. He endured the cross, despising its shame. He overcame all that that was done, all that that we did to him, and how we betrayed him and how we rejected him. He overcame that because he saw what was coming, and he saw it through, and he saves us. Today, are you saved by Jesus? Have you obeyed the gospel, the good news of Jesus? It is good news because it means we can be reconciled to him. We can be resurrected. We can have a new day. Start over. Be right with God. If we'll repent. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, if you believe he's the Son of God, if you understand that by God's power he's resurrected and by God's power you also can be resurrected from the old person of sin. Repent, confess him, put him on in baptism for forgiveness, being buried together with him, putting to death the old person, be resurrected together with him, a new creature created in Christ for good works. We have water prepared for you that you might obey him. God has done all of these things because he saw through these things. He saw beyond what we don't see and what we don't understand at the time. If today you're a Christian and have not lived right, repent. Realize that God is playing the long game, that he desires that you should be reconciled to him and that he will forgive if you dutifully repent and come back to him with all your heart in simple trusting faith and in prayer. If we can pray with you, we will, because none of us is immune to temptation. If you need today the prayers of the saints, or if you need today to obey the gospel of Jesus to become one of the saints, let us help you. Let your need in the Spirit be known by coming to the front now while together we stand and sing the song selected.